So we are on and welcome to our webinar this Wednesday before Thanksgiving and we're going to talk about a court case that has shocked the real estate world and boy I'll tell you it is a humdinger of a case. Thanks for tuning in you guys and so let's get going. So what we're going to do is we're going to have some fun today and I'm going to move this little image of me. <laughs> you can't see it, but I can. We're going to have some fun today. So before we look at this uh, real estate case, we're going to play 10 question real estate jeopardy. We're going to play 10 question real estate jeopardy. So here's what I'd like you to do. Um, the winners are going to receive a copy of my best selling book, How Fathers Change Lives. And again, I told this story before the webinar, which I'm not going to share now before the webinar officially started. And for those of you that were hanging in there early, about my dad and me, I think a big a part a big part of me writing this book. There's a lot in here about my dad and what an amazing person he was and how much he did for me. But also, it's about a lot of other fathers, their best stories, their best lessons. So, um, any the winners today, all of you are going to receive. We're not talking a PDF. We're going to talk about a real autographed copy of this book. And uh, by the way, uh, I don't know how much the book sells for on Amazon. But can you imagine whatever that is, let's say it's uh, $12, uh, how much an autograph copy with my personal autograph is going to be worth? <laughs> Guess what? Same amount, $12. But still, it'll be, it'll be, it'll be from me to you and uh, it'll be with, uh, with, uh, with my love to you. So, okay, so that's what the winner is going to get, winners are going to get today. You need to answer seven out of these 10 real estate jeopardy questions correctly to win. And what you're going to do is you'll number a piece of paper. So do that right now. Get out a piece of paper, number a piece of paper, one to 10, because they're going to be 10 questions. They're multiple choice. There's three choices. So all you have to do is write down like the one, two, or three. So it's going to be really easy for you. So just like when we get to question one, you'll write down whatever you think the answer is. Question one or answer one, answer two, answer two. You think they get it? Roseanne says, all right, maybe, am I overdoing this? All right, I'm over explaining this, guys. Sorry. It's the day before Thanksgiving. I'm just excited. I'm in a good mood today. It's totally fine. Okay. So here we go. If you score seven or 10, uh, then email Jen. Sorry, Jen. Uh, Jen, just what a work. What an amazing person she is. She did all the deck today. She is like totally awesome. Jen, I love you. Um, you email Jen at realestatemavericks.com with a photo of your answer sheet. Photo. <laughs> just take a phone shot of your answer sheet. And if it shows that you got more seven of ten, seven of ten or better, you're going to get a copy of my book in the mail. Be sure and put your address in there as well. Okay, so here we go. Question one: When is a real estate contract considered accepted? When is a contract, real estate contract, considered accepted? So, answer one: When it's signed by the last principal, that is the last person that needs to sign it, or when it's put in escrow with the deposit check, or when the seller's agent tells the buyer's agent that the seller has accepted the offer. Or I'll say in number three, that could be when the buyer's agent tells the seller agent that the buyer's accepted the counter offer, same thing. So is it one, when it's signed by the last principal, that is everybody signed it, two, when it's put in escrow with a deposit check, or three, when the seller's agent or buyer's agent relays the fact that the contract has been accepted? And the answer is number three. And this is what a lot of people in real estate don't know, and that is a contract is accepted when the fact of acceptance is communicated. And let me give you an example of how that can bite you in the butt. Um, one thing I learned early on in real estate is when, let's say in a typical situation where you might have a buyer that makes an offer on a property and the seller signs the contract. So the seller signs the contract. And this has happened more than once, trust me. So the seller signs the contract, it's done, it's accepted. So then the seller's agent doesn't do anything at that moment. Seller's agent gets in the car, goes back to the office, and maybe gets ready to fax a copy of the accepted contract over to the buyer's agent. And then all of a sudden the buyer's agent calls and the seller's agent picks up the phone and says, hi, how you doing? And the buyer's agent says, hey, I'm sorry. You know, my buyer just changed his mind. He had second thoughts. He found another home. Uh, we're withdrawing the contract. And you say, well, wait, you can't. It's already accepted. I've got it right here. I was just going to fax it to you. And it was accepted two hours ago. And let's say this is not a deal that's contingent. So, I mean, this would have been a deal. You know, that sometimes happens, just a straight out cash deal deposit. So, in that case, you know, in one where there's a buyer contingency, the buyer can bail anyway. So, you know, during some time period, so who cares? But all contracts aren't that way. So that's really a big deal when you have a cash contract. So the idea is, so the bottom line is, the buyer can withdraw that. The fact that the seller has accepted it, that is, signed it, doesn't mean anything 
Acceptance occurs at the moment that the fact of acceptance is communicated to the other party, and that can be through the agent. So you always remember that. So what I used to do, I've just did, done this for 35 years, is once my seller accepted a contract or my buyer accepted a counteroffer, whenever it was like the final acceptance, first thing I would do is call the agent for the, uh, for the other party, the seller or the buyer, and simply say, when they picked up the phone, before they even had a chance to say anything. I didn't say, hey, hello, how you doing? Isn't it a beautiful day? To give them a chance to say, oh, my party, my, my principal changed his mind. I would always say, hey, this is Greg. Congratulations. My seller or my buyer accepted the contract, et cetera, et cetera. And I also want to tell you one other thing that has nothing to do with contracts that I want to share with you. When you do that, whenever you are communicating the fact of acceptance in a deal, you want to tell a fight story. This is so important. Like you want to tell, like if you, you represent the seller and you're communicating to the buyer's agent that the seller's accepted the buyer's offer, you want to tell the big fight story about how hard it was. Oh my gosh, I can't even believe they accepted this offer. They wanted more and this and that and whatever, but I went through this and I told them this and you go through my best seller clothes. Maybe you did that where you get the seller thinking to themselves how, you know, when they actually turn this down, it's like buying their house back. They're really a buyer for that amount of money because they have it sold. And if they were an investor, is that what they'd really do? So you go and you say, I got them to accept this, but I can't even believe I did it. And why? It's so important that whether you're communicating how hard it was for you to get this done uh, to uh, on behalf of the seller to the buyer's agent, or if it's a counter offer, the buyer to the seller's agent, because you want that agent to relay back when they call their principal and say it was accepted. You want them to be sure and say, boy, I'll tell you, the other agent was telling me, man, oh man, they had to just do all this to get it done. That is really important because a sale doesn't, you don't cash a commission check until a closing. And a big part of what a lot of agents miss in this kind of a scenario, having nothing to do with the contracting itself, is keeping the buyer excited, keeping the seller excited throughout from the time that they sign and the contract's finally signed until closing. So you want to constantly send that kind of messaging that keeps them engaged. And that first message where it was really hard to get this done because my sellers just would never normally sell at this low a price, but they, they did it for this reason. Okay, enough said there. So that is number one. Hopefully you got that right. Let me bring up my thing here so I can... There we go, uh, let me go, whoops, we don't wanna to go to questions. Okay, so question two, what is the effect when a real estate contract's verbal? Well, you guys should know this, come on. So verbal contract real estate. So the contract is void, the contract is voidable, or the contract is unenforceable. Okay, is it one, is it two, is it three? This is a verbal real estate contract, contract that is not in writing. And the answer is, Number three, the contract is unenforceable. And I just want you to understand these terms, what they mean. A void. A contract is, that is void is like it never existed. And that's not the case with a verbal real estate contract. And I'm going to explain why to you in a minute. A contract which is voidable means that one of the parties, one or more of the parties, has the right to make it void, to say, not you know it's not the typical withdrawal it's make it void uh, the most common situation is when you contract with minors when an adult enters into a contract with a minor under the law the minor up until the age of majority uh, that is up until the time that they become an adult generally the minor can bail out of the contract but the adult can't and it's one of the reasons you need to be ultra careful when you contract with minors because you sell a minor a car and the you know somebody who's 16 you sell them a car the bottom line is that you're stuck in the deal but they're not they can take the car go out drive it around scratch it up even and then return it and get their money back because they're a minor so the bottom line is that's a typical voidable situation uh, a contract's void a typical example of a void contract would would be one that contemplates an illegal object so for example if you and i enter into a contract to rob a bank you're going to pay me 50,000 bucks if I'll go rob this bank. And we do a written, we do a contract on this. Um, bottom line is that contract's void because it, it doesn't even exist. The law won't recognize it. That's what void is. Uh, it's like an ineffective, meaningless ab initio. Ab initio is Latin from, from the beginning. Unenforceable. That's what a contract, a real estate, verbal real estate contract is. It's not void. The people can go ahead with it. It does exist. It does exist. 
Um, it's not voidable. It's not like either party can, you know, can say under the law, I void the contract because you can't do that. It is a valid contract. It's valid. It's just not enforceable. And what that means is there's a thing called the statute of frauds. You've probably heard of this. It really has nothing to do with the actual definition of fraud. I talked to you about fraud in my last little legal seminar. Fraud is the intentional misrepresentation of a material fact on which another person reasonably relies to their detriment. That's the word for word definition of fraud. Each of those elements has to be present. The statute of frauds has nothing to do with that. Statute of frauds was enacted back in England many, many years ago, and it was to prevent fraud in contracts. That is, certain contracts. Certain contracts were deemed by the English legislature to be so important that they needed to be codified in writing in order for the parties to be able to go to court and enforce them, go to court and enforce them. That's what the statute of frauds was. And by the way, real estate contracts are not the only type of contract. Under the, under the statute of frauds, and it's been really imported into the law in most states, I'm sure it exists in your state, and it generally very much pretty closely would resemble the old English statute of frauds, although there's some variations among states. What it generally says is contracts, and this is real estate now, contracts which create or convey an interest in real property must be in writing, signed by the party to be charged to be enforceable. Who's the party to be charged? That's the party who is being sued, who is basically saying, trying to skate out on the deal. They have to initial or it's signed it. That's what, and, and that, that wording is important. Contracts which create or convey an interest in real property uh, are unenforceable unless they're reflected in a writing with the material terms. It could be a napkin. It doesn't have to be this nine page form whatever contract that you use, it can be just on a napkin, has to have the material terms, identify the property, who are the parties, what's the price, when's it going to close, pretty much that's about it, and that's it, and if that's reflected in a writing, then it is enforceable. Just so you know, the statute of frauds does apply generally to other some other things as well. Uh, for example, contracts in contemplation of marriage, contracts in contemplation of marriage have to be in writing to be enforceable. Now, you're probably thinking that means like if somebody agrees to marry somebody else. Well, yeah, but really what that means is like when people say, for example, I'll give you $5,000 if you'll marry Roseanne. Somebody says, hey, Greg, I would, you know, many years ago, I would give you $5,000 if you'd married Roseanne. Well, that because that's a contract that contemplates marriage as a material element, that would have to be in writing. And if then I bilateral, I would say, okay, I'll marry Roseanne. Give me the 5,000 and I'll marry Roseanne. Um, what do you think, Roseanne? You're worth five grand, huh? <laughs> it's, uh, believe me, it cost me a lot more than five grand to get. Yeah, I got the better part of that deal, right? It cost me a lot more than five grand to get, to get that, but it was well worth it. So in any case, I don't know why I'm just in a funny mood today. So, so uh, contracts and contemplation of marriage. Another type of contract uh, generally in most states that uh, has to be in writing to be enforceable is con if contracts, this is under the Uniform Commercial Code, contracts for the sale of personal property of $500 or more. So contracts for less than $500 do not have to be in writing. For more than $500 for personal property generally do have to be in writing. And uh, another one, uh, I think the last one I'll just throw out to you for fun, contracts which by their definition, by the terms of the contract, would necessarily take more than one year to perform. So for example, an employment contract for 12 months or more, for over 12 months, for a year or more. I think it's for one year or more, for one year or more. Any type of contract to build a house. If there's a contract to build a house and it says this house is to be built over 14 months, then that would have to be in writing. And by the way, a building contract is not, uh, is not a contract which creates or convey an interest in real estate, in real property. So a building contract a, a contract to build a home uh, does not have to be in writing unless it falls within one of the other provisions to be enforceable. Now, I know you say to yourself, but Greg, the contract's not in writing. How do you prove it? You never can think about the difference between 
uh, proving, the, the having the evidence to prove something and whether legally it's enforceable or not. Yeah, much better to have it in writing. But maybe you have recordings of the conversations. Maybe you have whatever you have. You know, I did a little thing, if you haven't got it, on when you can legally record conversations. Jen will be glad to send you the link to that little video that I have up on YouTube. I think it's actually public. And you can learn in there when you can legally record conversations. And sometimes it's a good idea. So you can prove things without a writing, but being able to prove things without a writing does you no good if the statute of fraud says to be enforceable, it must be in writing. Okay, enough on that. Sorry, I just thought I'd give you a little quick education on the statute of fraud just because I'm in the mood to do it today. So, okay, so that is answer is number three, probably TMI, more information than you wanted in that particular question. Question number three, can a buyer withdraw an offer before the time for acceptance has expired? So the answers are always, never, if it hasn't been presented to the seller. So I'll give you, what was the, what's the Jeopardy music there? Isn't there Jeopardy music? Do, 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 do. Yeah, I don't sing very well, so we won't do that. So that's why you're a coach and not a singer. That's why I'm a coach and not a singer. So, all right. So always, never, or if it hasn't been presented to the seller. And the answer is generally always. So here's the deal. A, an offer is can always be withdrawn up until the time that it's been accepted and when has it been accepted when the fact of acceptance has been communicated back to you know the the buyer or the seller whoever you know it, it needs to be communicated to and so the answer is generally always that an offer that is an offer from a buyer to a seller or a counter offer from a seller back to a buyer can always gener always be withdrawn simply by communicating to the other side that we wish to withdraw that. And that can be done even after the other side has signed it as long as the fact of, the fact of acceptance has not been communicated back. So the answer there, and the reason I say, you know, like almost always is there, there would be an exception, but the exception is really what's known as an option. We're going to talk about that later. If, and this rarely happens, if someone makes an offer on something and it's really not an option. If someone makes an offer on something and the other side says, look, I'll pay you 50 bucks to leave that offer open for two days for me to think about and accept, then then it cannot be withdrawn. If there's consideration paid, which you rarely deal in this, I know, but if there's consideration paid to leave the offer open for a certain time, then it cannot be withdrawn and can be accepted within that time frame. Okay, so the answer there is, we're gonna say number one. Okay, next, question number four, what is the effect of adding time as of the essence to a contract? Time is of the essence to a contract. First, there's no legal effect, it doesn't mean anything. Second is to emphasize the importance, the importance of performing on time. Or number three, it's to void the contract if the exact time frames aren't met. So here we go. Put down your answer. Is it one? Is it two? Is it three? And the answer is it is number three. And I know you know that. The idea is, and void's really not the right word there. It's to, you know, we'll, we'll call it whatever. Void is really not the best word to use. But the bottom line is uh, what happens when you put time is of the essence is essentially you're saying this under the law. So, you know, here's the more official version. And I don't want to, I don't mean to boast, but I, I know this stuff pretty well. I got the top score on the bar exam when I took the Arizona bar exam, like, uh, was it six, seven, eight years ago? I took my first bar exam in Ohio, like when I was a kid after law school, I told you that my dad's story. But then uh, in Arizona, when the market crashed and I was bored here, I took six months off, studied, and I got the top score on the bar exam. And uh, I just, I just like totally <laughs> just learned this stuff really well. And I'll just as an aside, I used a learning system that I developed called L4X, how to learn twice as much in half the time. I developed that because I had so little time and so much to learn. And oh my gosh, I can't tell you how it worked. And if you uh, have anyone in your family who is uh, in school, um, go to, uh, you can call, you can get email Jen and she'll send you a copy or just Google Greg Haig how to learn twice as much in half the time. It's a, I wrote it in a Huffington Post article. You can just bring it right up. You ought to just relay that to them because that's what enabled me. I mean, having figured that out before I started my study, I mean, that is what enabled me to, it's not that I'm so smart at all. Believe me, I have no photographic memory, trust me. And Roseanne can tell you how many things I forget all the time. But the bottom line is that study system works. So, um, so it's an uh, answer is number three. 
And, um, and Stu, the, the idea is this. Under the law in contracts, all time frames, unless you specify otherwise by using the term generally, time is of the essence, all time frames have a little fudge factor. And when I say have a little fudge factor, the courts would look at the, uh, for example, if I say I'm going to deliver certain things to you, uh, let's say three dozen apples to you uh, on a certain date, on a certain date and time, and it's for a party. Let's say I know you're going to have this apple party. A stupid apple party. Why would I think about an apple party? So the bottom line is, I know, Roseanne, what am I? It's just whatever. <laughs> it's an apple party. Bottom line is that if I'm an hour late, say I'd say I'm going to deliver them at uh, 9 a.m. on this certain morning and your party starts at 4 p.m. that day. If I'm an hour late, I get them there at 10 a.m., that's no big deal. You're not going to be able to say, forget it, you were late if time was not set of the essence. Now, if I deliver them at 4.30 p.m. after the party started and I was aware and I was aware that you had a party coming, the court would say, no way, Greg, take your apples back. Um, you know, the part person doesn't have to pay. But the point is, the idea of time is of the essence is to firm up time frames because otherwise the courts allow a reasonable time fudge factor based on the circumstances in terms of what both parties know. So the answer is number three. Okay, number four. After accepting an offer, can sellers keep their home on the market and accept backup offers? So after accepting an offer, can sellers keep their home on the market and accept backup offers? Uh, choices are yes, or with purchaser consent, or with purchaser's written consent. Because remember, contracts, statute of frauds, contracts which create or convey an interest in real property must be in writing, and we are dealing with a real estate contract here, so uh, should it be number three? So put down an answer, is it one, is it two, is it three? And again, can they withdraw? And the answer is yes. And it doesn't have to be with purchaser, I'm sorry, can they keep their home on the market? And the answer is it does not have to be with purchaser consent, does not have to be with purchaser written consent. The bottom line is unless the contract says otherwise, any seller in any situation, real estate or otherwise, can keep their home on the market and accept backup offers. It's just that simple. The fact that they accept a contract with a buyer doesn't mean they can't go out and try to improve upon that. Doesn't mean they can cancel the contract with the buyer, but to improve upon that or it's simply to match that and put a backup in place in case the first deal falls through. Only time they couldn't do that is if the uh, they have a written agreement not to do it. Okay, so the answer is yes. And uh, question number six, can sellers capriciously cancel a listing contract, your listing contract before its expiration date? And the answers are yes, wouldn't that be awful? Two, if they pay the expenses you incurred. And three, answer no. Okay, so do, 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 okay. The answer is generally yes. I have to say generally because there could be some exceptional situations, but let me explain to you why. Under the law, there are two basic types of contracts. You've heard of these, one's a unilateral contract, One's a bilateral contract. So a bilateral contract is a gen generally a promise in exchange for a promise. For example, a purchase contract on real estate is a bilateral contract. I promise to sell you my home. You promise to give me certain consideration, a certain purchase price. So it's two promises. And then they go ahead and execute on those promises and close the contract. That's what's known as a bilateral contract. Let's say I say my, I have my car for sale for $15,000 and you take a look at it and you say, Greg, I'll buy your car for $15,000 and we shake on it. Now, first of all, remember under the statute of frauds in most states, contracts for the sale of personal property of $500 or more have to be in writing to be enforceable. Now, if that's not in writing, no big deal. We can go ahead and close the deal. But if one of us changes our mind, generally we won't be able to enforce it because it's for $15,000 more than $500 in the statute of frauds that require it. But the bottom line is that is still a bilateral contract. I have promised to sell you my car for uh, $15,000. You've promised to give me $15,000. So that's the consideration of the promises. So that's a bilateral contract. You're familiar with that. Those Most contracts are that. Then there's a thing called a unilateral contract. Look at a listing contract carefully. 
A unilateral contract, uh, uh, the, the law school example that we would use, and when I taught contract law at, law, at the law school here, um, this is you know the typical kind of example. Unilateral contracts, if I say to you, I'll give you $200 if you'll walk across that bridge before 4 p.m. today. So just walk across that bridge before 4 p.m. today and I'll give you $200. Maybe I just want to take photographs of you walking across the bridge. It doesn't matter. So you're not promising to walk across the bridge. That's the key here. You can walk across the bridge or not walk across the bridge. It's unilateral. I'm making a promise based on your performing an act. If you perform the act, I have to perform the promise. If you don't perform the act, I don't have to perform the promise. You don't have to perform the act. You do not have to perform the act. So think about a listing contract because that's exactly what it is. Under a listing contract, the seller makes a promise. What's the promise? The seller, essentially, if you take all the junk away, all those provisions, essentially all a listing contract is, is it says that I, the seller, promise to pay you a certain amount of commission, a certain fee, in the event that you procure a purchaser ready, willing, and able to purchase my home, my property, based on the terms of the listing contract, whatever they are, which is generally at full price, you know, on my terms, whatever's in here. Usually there's just the price term. So, so the seller doesn't have to accept it, but if you procure this purchaser who says they'll pay full price, that's unilateral. Now, do you make a promise? No. Look at a listing contract. You do not make a promise in a listing contract. You simply are going to go out and do your best to make that happen. And if you don't make that happen, the seller can't sue you. You have not breached a promise. That's what's known as a unilateral contract. Well, typically in most states, a unilateral contracts can always be withdrawn by the person who makes the promise prior to the time that the act is performed, prior to the time that the act is performed. So that would give rise, even though the listing contract is for a certain time period, that is the seller is saying, you know, I'll leave this, this listing contract is good for six months. So they're saying, if you sell my home, then I want you to know this, this is really important. If you sell my home within this six month period, then I will pay you a certain fee, a certain commission. Well, the bottom line is, that doesn't mean they can't cancel that prior to the six month period. And a lot of realtors are mistaken about that. A lot of brokers are mistaken about that. There are a lot of court cases on that. Sellers can cancel listing contracts. So it's critical, and most of them don't know it, thank goodness, I suppose, thank goodness. So the bottom line is they can still, there could be, if the seller reasonably, and here's the last little thing I'll say to give you a little deeper knowledge in this, if the seller reasonably um, was aware that you were spending a significant amount of money to market their home. If they were aware of that, then possibly they might have to reimburse you the funds you spent. But that's a possibly. And unless the listing contract says that, unless there's uh, something where there were conversations between you and the seller, because remember a listing contract, uh, I know that listing contracts under your licensing law are required to be in writing, but they're not required to be in writing under the under uh, the statute of frauds so i want you to be aware that any conversations that you might have with a seller that you could prove those would be enforceable as well so uh, the bottom line is the answer is generally less yes listing contracts can be canceled by sellers and so obviously that makes it triply important that you keep sellers happy during the course of your listings okay number seven is a real estate contract valid with no earnest deposit by the buyer so here are your answers no no, it's not. So again, just so you know the question, is a real estate contract valid if there's no earnest money deposit? That is the buyer makes an offer and the seller accepts it, but there's no earnest money deposit. So uh, no, because it would lack consideration. I'm sure you guys know that consideration is an important element, not an important, it's a critical element of every enforceable contract. In order to be enforceable, contracts have to have consideration. So, so no, it would lack consideration. There's no earnest money, right? Or yes, consideration is not required in a real estate contract, or yes, earnest deposits are not required, earnest deposits are not required. So the again, the question is, is real estate contract valid with no earnest deposit? And the answer is three, yes, earnest deposits are not required. Uh, earnest deposits are nice, but they're not required. Now, you might say, well, what's the difference between answer two and three? Uh, earnest deposits are not consideration. The consideration in a purchase contract, 
uh, the consideration, these are the promises. These are the things that the people are promising to do. The consideration from the seller to the buyer is what? Well, it's the house, okay? The tangible house, okay? The consideration from the buyer to the seller is what? Uh, it is the purchase price, giving them the money. And so the bottom line is that's the consideration. The earnest deposit is not consideration. So you do not need deposits on any type of contract, contract to buy a car, contract to buy a house. Now, obviously, it's a really good idea. I'm not suggesting that it's not a great idea. I'm simply suggesting be aware that an earnest deposit is not an essential element of a contract. Contract is perfectly enforceable without. Question eight, what is the seller's consideration, that is obligation, we just talked about that, in an option on real estate? So in an option, what is the seller's consideration, the seller's consideration will say to the buyer? Okay, to keep the property off the market during the option period, so to keep the property off the market during the option period. Number two, to sell to the buyer, okay, the person who is the, op the options in favor of, to sell to this buyer at a specified price during the option period. Or number three, to give that buyer, to give the person who the option's in favor of, the first right, the first option to buy it if another option is received, if another offer is received. Okay, so which of those three so again, to look at the question, what is the seller's consideration, that is, what is their obligation in an option when they give an option on real estate? So first of all, an option. So you understand what an option is. An option is, and I'm, I'm sure you know this, an option is where one party agrees for a certain period of time to sell another party, as some, whatever it is, let's call it real estate, it could be a car, to sell another party whatever it is at a specified price and maybe on specified terms. So, and what you're buying with an option and generally the, the party who the option's in favor of needs to pay consideration. An option is a contract. It's a bilateral contract. It's not a unilateral contract. There are, there is a flow of consideration here. Um, basically the party is one party is paying money. I promise to give you $400, the considerations of $400, if you'll give me, uh, if you'll give me the right, the right to buy your home for $195,000 for the next three days. Okay, so that would be a bilateral contract where one, what, one party's promising to give for this money and the other party's saying, okay, I promise that uh, you can buy my home for $195,000 for the next four days. So that's what an option is. And I want to distinguish that. I do have a thing on a right of first refusal. Uh, that is not the same as a right of first refusal, and you'll, as you'll learn for a minute. So the answer here is to sell to the buyer at a specified price during the option period. You don't, you don't have to take it off the market. Now, if you have something on the market and you've optioned it, you can't sell it during that option period. I mean, you can, but you'd be sued and you'd lose, but you can keep it on the market. There's nothing that says you can't have it on the market. And you're not giving the buyer the number three, the first option to buy it if another offer is received. That's a right of first refusal. So that's different. That's a right of first refusal. So the answer is number two. Okay, question nine. How is a right of first refusal different from an option? Well, I just told you that. Um, it's a unilateral contract, so no consideration is needed, okay? Or it usually contains no specified price or terms, or there is no difference, just a different name for the same thing. Well, the answer is number two. It usually contains no specified purchase price or terms because a right of first refusal generally would, would, would be where somebody says, I will give you, if I receive another offer, I will give you the right to match that, step in and buy my property, buy my thing, buy whatever it is, if I receive another offer. So it usually a right of first refusal does not have a specified purchase price or and terms like an option. Now, I want to mention to you, it could. I mean, a weird right of refusal could be one where if you receive an offer on your property or, a, you know, another a, an offer on your property, I then have the right to come in. I then have the right to come in and buy that property for um, $3,000 more than the offer you received. I mean, you could actually work in some kind of a price thing to a right of first refusal, but it wouldn't be typical. Okay, so uh, now number 10. Can a text, and this is where we're going to get to the recent court case that kind of shook the world of real estate, at least back east, and I think that you'll see that happening 
in the West and in the Midwest, can a text message substitute for a signed acceptance of a written offer for real estate? And so put your answer down. The answer is yes or no, or depends on the state. And again, can a text message substitute for a signed acceptance of a written offer on real estate? And you put your answer down, yes, no, or depends on the state. And the answer is going to be depends on the state. And I think you'll see more and more states where this is the case. Let me take you through the case. A recent Massachusetts case um, it could well have national import uh, in terms of changing the way over time that we buy and sell real estate. Um, basically, here are the facts, and I laid them out for you, and you're welcome, as you know, to the slide deck for all my webinars. In a text message, a listing broker acknowledged certain terms were acceptable. So they had been negotiating a deal, and the listing broker acknowledged that certain terms were acceptable and, and that they basically had a deal. Okay, now we don't have a writing yet. So remember I talked to you about the statute of frauds. And since we don't have anything in writing, that doesn't mean it's enforceable, but basically they all said, we've got a deal. We've got a deal. So then the, the uh, listing broker, the agent for the seller, acknowledged that we have a deal, we're all set, and asked the buyer's broker to have the buyer sign first and deliver the contract for the seller's signature. So follow me in this fact pattern. So they agreed, the two agents now agreed, we have a deal. They said, my principal agrees with your principal, we've got a deal. So the seller, seller's agent says, and here is the text, this is the text here, um, wants you, and this is the case, St. John's Holdings, to sign first uh, with a check, uh, they were the buyer, St. John's Holdings is the buyer, uh, two electronics was the seller, uh, with a check, and then he, will, then he will sign. This is the actual text message. Um, normally, and he says in the text message, normally the seller signs last, which is typically the case on a typical offer situation. Not trying to be stupid or contrary, but that is the way it normally works. Um, and can Rick, and Rick would be the seller. Again, this is being communicated to the seller's agent. Can Rick uh, McDonald, the seller, sign today and get it to me today, sign Tim. Uh, okay, so there you go. And now, uh, text message back, Tim, I have the signed LOI, and that was his last name, by the way, there, uh, that you see, the cephalotoberry. I have the signed L LOI. It was actually a, a LOI, but an enforceable LOI, letter of intent. And check, it is 4.24 p.m., where can I meet you? So uh, this, is the, this is the agent for the buyer now. This is the agent for the buyer, text messaging back, Tim, Tim being the agent for the seller, Tim being the agent for the seller. I have the signed LOI and the check, and it's 4.24 p.m., where can I meet you? So now, later that day, both these brokers spoke over the phone and the buyer's broker delivered, delivered the four signed copies of the contract that he said he had along with the deposit check to the seller's broker. So he went over and delivered this. Now, on that same day, the seller accepted another offer. Another offer for a little bit more came in. The seller accepted it, did not accept, did not sign off on the contracts that these buyer agents had brought over. And so... Uh, the next day, then another day goes by and the buyer's broker texts the seller's broker about the status. It says, you know, what's going on? I mean, uh, when am I going to get my signed contracts back? And this is the seller there. Um, this is the, the seller's agent texts back and says his seller, Matt, is out of town today. He will get back to us tomorrow. Now, this is after he knows the contract's been signed. This thing's been accepted. So what a disgenuine text. But um, he's out of town. He'll get back to us tomorrow. So shortly thereafter, the seller refused to execute the deal with the buyer, obviously because he'd sold the place to someone else. Now, the buyer files a lawsuit claiming that the seller's agency, obviously we don't have the statute of frauds. Again, I mentioned this to you early on. That's why we went through our little real estate Q&A here today so you'd understand this case better. The statute of frauds requires that real estate, uh, that any I'm sorry, <laughs> that contracts which create or convey an interest in real property have to be in writing to be enforceable. So here, the seller didn't sign off on the contracts. Typically, what the statute of frauds has always meant is that you have written paper contracts, written paper contracts you sign off on. And so, and, and even in states which have an electronic signature act, many states have electronic signature acts that allow 
things like DocuSign, where people sign online, those to be effective. So that makes those kind of signatures effective under the statute of frauds. But this was not that case. This was not a situation where the seller, through like a DocuSign kind of uh, protocol, even signed off. You know, so you don't have to sign off in pen, but you can sign off on computer. But that didn't happen. This is just text messages back and forth. So the buyer files a lawsuit in spite of the fact that there was no written acceptance by the seller claiming that the seller's agent's text message created an offer. When the seller's agent text message and says, we have a deal, we have a deal. And they made a big deal about the fact that he signed off Tim and said, Tim, you know, we have a deal, signed Tim, that we have a deal that that, that agent represents obviously is the agent for the principal, agent for the seller, communicating that we have a deal by text message. So the court says, uh, so he files lawsuits claiming the sellers had created an offer that they accepted by delivering a signed offer and a deposit check to the listing broker. So that's what the buyer is saying. According to Massachusetts law, now this is Massachusetts law, text messages, they actually have this codified in their law, text messages, accompanied by a signed written agreement that contains all material terms can form contracts under that state statute of fraud. So you follow me on that? According to their law, a text message, as long as there's a signed written agreement that contains all material terms can form contracts under the state statute of frauds. Well, think about this. We had a signed written agreement that contained all material terms. There was no doubt about that. And who was it signed by? It was signed by the buyer. It was signed by the buyer, just not the seller. So the decision of the court was that the text between the buyer's broker and the seller's broker did meet the statute of frauds requirement, which states the text messages alongside a written agreement that contains the material terms of a deal can be considered a legally binding contract. So the bottom line is the buyer won and the seller, I'm sorry, the buyer won and the seller was enjoined, was prohibited from selling to the other buyer. So that's what happened out there. And note that there must be, a, in Massachusetts, that there must be a written contract with all material terms that accompany the text message acceptance. Now I wanna run you through a quick other case here. And in July, the Massachusetts court ruled in a similar situation. The previous case was on commercial property, not that it matters, but it ruled on a similar situation involving residential property. And that was a situation where the buyer's representative and the listing broker, so the buyer's agent and the listing agent, chatted about a signed purchase agreement, chatted about a signed purchase agreement, and a copy of an earnest money check, okay? They chatted about it. And then there was this text message. I've got it right on the screen for you. These are the exact text message. This is the buyer's agent. Good afternoon. I emailed an offer over to you, okay? So now we do have a written contract. We have a written offer listing broker hi mike won't hear back till morning talk to you then so basically communicating i won't i won't know till morning i'll let you know then and then comes back the next day may 13th this is the seller's agent saying hi he and that would be the seller said he would split the difference at 962.5 and then the uh i'm sorry this is the buyer's rep buyer's rep so i'm i had back for it. The buyer's rep comes back and says, look, he'll split the difference with you uh, at 962.5. So then the listing broker says, okay, I'll convey it. I'll convey it to the sellers. And then the listing broker the next day comes back and says, hi, Mike, the sellers, the sellers accept the price. So the sellers accept the price. So you can see the negotiations by text here, and there is a final acceptance by text message. And Remember, there was an offer, there was a written offer emailed over, uh, and over it, so there was something in writing at the same time. So this is also in Massachusetts. So what was the decision of the court here? So here, according to the record, the check wasn't sent to the listing broker and the purchase agreement was never signed. That The purchase agreement was never signed um, by what the either either party. So the seller sold the home to another buyer. So the sellers went ahead and sold it to another buyer. So what happened? The court ruled in favor of the seller saying you can sell it to another buyer because there wasn't a signed written agreement that contained all material terms. The purchase contract that was sent over did not have the 962.5. So it didn't have the material terms and it was not signed by the buyer uh, so there was no signed purchase contract containing material terms. So they, again, are going by the statute literally. 
Um, the bottom line is the takeaway here is that uh, I, you're going to need to be more careful about the text messages. You, you can't know this could have gone the other way. And so just be careful with your text messages, um, with your emails, that you're communicating in a way that doesn't end up getting your buyer or your seller obligated to a deal that they really don't want to do that they didn't agree to. And there's the bottom line. And also the other takeaway is to recognize what's happening now out in the world. I think you do that. There are even companies. There's uh, the guy who founded uh, one of the guys who founded Uber uh, actually started a company where he's, he's got online negotiation. He's trying to streamline, and this is a heavy hitter guy, he's trying to streamline the whole negotiation process with making offers and everything that transparent to everybody and uh, basically try, and, and that could well result, those kinds of uh, facilitations of making real estate negotiations uh, happen online, be more seamless, be easier, those are going to probably result in some law cases. Uh, they're probably going to result in some updated law in your state in the months and years ahead. So just keep your eye on this because I do think we'll see an evolution, not a revolution, but an evolution in this area where it's going to be, where, where people are going to be obligated to do things um, in manners. It's going to be, cre it's going to happen in ways that it hasn't happened before. Okay, well, I hope you guys enjoyed this little Q&A. Again, I remind you, if you got seven out of 10 or more, take a little shot of your thing and send it to Jen at Real Estate Mavericks. We'd love to send you a copy of my book, How Fathers Change Lives, autograph. And if you'd like some links to our Maverick webinars, uh, just email, again, Jen at realestatemavericks.com. Um, I am going to do my webinar of the year, my big webinar of the year on December 14th at 9.30 Pacific. Um, if you'd like an invite to that, email Jen at Real Estate Mavericks. I'm going to be talking about the perfect real estate model. This is a big deal, guys. I've spent a lot of time putting together a culmination of this year. What I believe is would be for right now where we are in real estate, a real estate model, uh, both a seller side and buyer side model that would make you most likely to make the most money now, but yet position yourself for the future of real estate. Uh, it's got a lot of elements in it that I think might, um, not sure if they'll shock you, but they may startle you. Um, but it's, a, it's really, in many ways, a whole different way to list and sell homes. And so if you'd uh, like an invite to that, um, we have a maximum limit here at Zoom, and uh, I expect we'll go over our maximum limit, so I'll have to shut that off, uh, you know, in terms of the number of people who can attend. So all of you who have been attending my webinars, I want to make sure you get in. Uh, because uh, and you get or you get registered because I want you to so email Jen at real estate Mavericks and make sure she'll send you a link where you can register right now for that and that's on December 14th again if you can't make it live you'll get a copy of the video and uh, again I ask you if you enjoyed I always do if you enjoyed this webinar I'd really appreciate kind of is just a favor to me uh, connect with me on LinkedIn and then write me a re recommendation under my real estate Mavericks brand that's really big deal to me I have uh, most recommended uh, real estate speaker and trainer and coach on LinkedIn. In fact, I have, uh, if you look at it, I have more recommendations than all of the other major trainers combined. And that just really means a lot to me. I really appreciate you guys doing that. Um, quite frankly, that's more important to me than your money, uh, that you just show a little appreciation and that you're, you're benefiting and you show some appreciation with a couple, three sentences. So if you're not connected, connect with me, write me two or three sentences. Hey, and by the way, if you're totally bored, with what I'm doing, then just say that, you know, I attend because I've got nothing else to do, but <laughs> Greg, you're boring. Hey, that'll help me. I'll read that. And maybe I'll try to spice it up a bit. So I'll just finish this webinar. I hope I didn't run too much over by saying that I did a Voxer last night, my Voxer, the five minute audios I do every day. And by the way, if you're not in our Voxer group, you should email Jen and Jen will get you in our Voxer group. But I talked about thought leadership and um, I'm just going to share this, this, real quick thing with you. Um, my son, Brian, has been doing some of the daily boxers, and he has been sharing um, what we're going to call the danger report. And the danger report is a study that came out on what age, how real estate agents may become irrelevant, and the things, the five main things they can do to remain relevant in this very quickly changing world of real estate. And 
Uh, I, Brian's covered three or four of them. I have not read the study. I'm just listening to his audios. But the one thing that occurred to me that I haven't heard yet, and maybe it's number five, but I just hit it last night, is if there was any one thing, there was any one thing that I believe you should be doing to remain relevant in real estate and, uh, and to become more relevant in real estate, it's becoming a thought leader. And when you look back to, uh, like yesterday was the anniversary of John F. Kennedy's assassination. That was a, I remember that day. Uh, I was alive then and what a horrible day in our history, you know, in 1963. Um, but and you look back at some of the great thought leaders in our nation, Abraham Lincoln, uh, Joan of Arc, uh, you just go back and look at some of these people and some of them really did uh, suffer um, a lot of, a lot of uh, ridicule. Uh, of course, Abraham Lincoln was assassinated, Joan, Joan of Arc, I mean, you know, it's all these people, what they, Martin Luther King. Um, but the thing is, uh, the thing is, these are people who they just didn't go out there and put out information. And I see so much information being proliferated. I mean, you can find anything on Google. That is not thought leadership. Thought leadership, guys, is you looking at this industry that you're in that I hope you love like I do. And you saying to yourself, you know, what, what out there could be better? What could be different and what could be better? What could be different and what could be better? It's not just about how much I can make. It's what could be different and what could be better. And that, and then you say, and then you don't care. You don't care what other, you're, you're, you don't pander the polls. You're not worried about a popularity contest. If other realtors in your office don't agree with you because you're doing some crazy fee structure that isn't the typical what they've done, so what? What you're going to do is you're going to prove they're wrong. You're going to go out there and you're going to do what? You're going to prove to them that what your way is, is a better way for your clients and it's a better way for you and it's a better way for the industry. You're going to lead thought. You're going to change people's perspective. And that's what Abraham Lincoln did. That's what George Washington did. That's what Joan of Arc did. You know, that's what John F. Kennedy did. You know, they changed perspectives. They took a stance. Was always the most popular stance. They're not like politicians where they just pander to the polls. You know, they believe deeply in something and they went for it. Not going to share this with you. You know, back, uh, gosh, in 1980s when I launched my 990 opportunity. And 990 opportunity is where I gave sellers the opportunity to hold their own homes open. If they found their own buyer, then instead of charging them my, my back then 6% commission, uh, I would just do the deal for $990. I thought when I, when I thought that up, I thought, what a win-win. You know, um, m most of the time it'll sell co-broke, so I'll make percentage commission most of the time. Sometimes they'll end up getting the 990. So what? I'll get a lot more business. Some sellers will save money. I'll make a lot of normal commissions. I'll build a big data database, big sphere of influence. I just thought win, win, win situation. You can't even believe the tirade of crap that I got from other realtors, traditional realtors, about me doing that on a total win-win, allowed me to earn more. My sellers loved it, got photographs of people where they did end up with a 990, but it was just all these traditionalists out there that, you know, were just constantly saying, Greg, that's a, this and that. I mean, sometimes they were even saying, we're not even going to show your listings. You know, they make a full 3% Cobra. My point is, I was, I'm, now I look back, back then, that was tough on me. Actually, it hurt my feelings. I mean, all the, the people, the real, traditional realtors that were shooting at me. Um, today, I look back and I'm proud of that. You know, that was, a, that was something I did one of the first times that I really, in real estate, led thought. Just didn't go down the flow, but I came up with something and I led thought. And so that's why, and I'll finish today. I, number one, encourage you. Don't, you don't have to buy into whatever. I, I, I hope you agree with some of the things I teach, but the idea is not about me. It's about you. Where do you see things in this business? Where do you see that you can make a difference, that you can make a positive change? And then don't worry about how popular it is with your broker. Don't worry about how popular it is with the other agents. You go out there and you prove you're right. You lead thought. You get them to start thinking your way. And that's when you can say to yourself that there is a maverick in you, and that's when you can start asking the people around you, the people that are starting to see that you know what you're doing, you can start asking them, is there a maverick in you? Hey, you guys, thanks for attending, and you have an amazing Thanksgiving tomorrow, and uh, I will hang on here. I'm going to stop the recording, but if you have any questions, I'll hang on. Uh, I've run a little bit over here, but again, thanks for attending, and we'll see you next Wednesday. Bye-bye.